and welcome back. Now let's see the third of our four-part series, the linker. What does that do for us? So where are we now? The linker is the third stage. The compiler's done its work. You've got a .s file. The assembler's done its work. I've got a .o file. You might have a lot of .o files. You might have library.o files, or maybe .a files, which are library files that have been wrapped together into a .a file, which is like a big package of them all. And the linker's job is to put them all together, gather them all together at the table, and produce an a.out or executable file. So I just said most of this here. You take the .os from the libraries and from all the user files. The goal is to produce an executable. The process of doing that is called linking. And really, the benefit of this you've seen before is many different files can be authored, and you don't have to do the whole process of compiling and assembling them. If you have them all in .os, if you only change one file, you only need to change, recompile that one, reassemble that one, and then relink the whole thing together. So it's still linking is the kind of um, bottleneck of the whole process where all of those have to come together, but the compilation and assembly can be done only for the small file that got changed, which is really quite nice because some of these, some of the sources from the code, Linux, uh, Photoshop, can be really, really massive. And you make one line change, you shouldn't have to do all that work of compiling, assembling all of those. You only have to relink them. And oh, I should say, um, the old name for this was called the link editor because the thing that you're doing is you're fixing all of the links that are on the relocation table. The relocation table says, this is the stuff we didn't know those absolute addresses yet. So those are the links that I need to fix. And so the link editor, linker, comes from the name link editor, which is you're fixing those links from jumping links. So again, each the .o file has three parts to it, the .text, all the code, .data, which is all the data, and all the information, all the symbol table, relocation table, debugging information is in the info. Every one of the .os has that. They all come together from the linker's point of view, and you get an a dot out by taking all the, all the texts and putting them together. You have some order to them all, so you know that foo comes before bar, comes before library. Let's say foo, bar, and some math library, okay? So it's foo, bar, math library, text, foo, bar, math library, data, and then you use the information to fix those links in there. So that's the idea. So again, take the, all the text, go together in what order, put them together, concatenate them together, put all the data, concatenate them together, and then resolve those references. Go through that relocation table, find your symbols, and figure out what's happening, and put in the absolute addresses. Four types of addressing. You've got PC relative addressing. We love PC relative addressing because PC relative means it's position independent code, PIC. Branch equal, branch not equal, JAL with AU add upper media PC plus add I. All those things are relative to the PC and I don't need to worry about that. I love that. The other three though, we have to always relocate. That's the part that the linker's like, oh boy, I gotta do some work here. And that's for any absolute function address. So a function call, here, that's an absolute call, not a relative call. We saw that before. An external function call, certainly, I, I don't know what that is. I, I mean, even though it might have been in the same call, I mean, the same function, but if it's, a, if, it's referred from, if it's referred to based on an absolute function, still got to relocate that one. If it's an external function, I, if it's foo's call bar's function, certainly, I don't know where bar was in the final resting place. I got to re relocate that guy. And any static data. If I have any static data that's maybe relative to the static area, I don't know where the static area was going to be. All that stuff has to be there. Okay, easy. So, which instructions need relocation editing? Well, jump and link. All of those upper bits here need to be modified as a, as a result of that. IS format, this is relative to the static area. This global pointer points to the beginning of the static area that says, here's where all the static stuff starts. Well, this is all relative to that, that static area, but since I don't know where the static area is until I finally put it there, until I finally have text, 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 data, 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 that right here is the beginning of the static area, that's when I now know uh, where that value is, and this will be filled in here, and this is gonna be relative to that, these values will be relative to that. How about conditional branches? Do I need to do any work there? No, conditional branches are all branch equal and branch not equal. These are all these conditional things that are all PC relative, position of independent code. Don't need to worry about that. These values would have been filled in, filled in already. These are not like X's, to do's. Actually, they're, usually they set them to zeros, but they're set as like to do's. That, the final number is there. Don't need to worry about those at all. I'm pretty good. Does it start from zero? We always talk about the code starts at zero. Actually, the linker assumes the first word of your first text segment starts at 10,000 in hex, which ends up being 64K. Um, if you think about this, each of these hex is four bits. So that's four bits here, four bits here at 16. So that means this is two to the 16th. So two to the 16th is 64K. So it starts at the 64K place is where the first text segment ends. And that's like text one, text two, text three, data one, data two, data three, and then above that is what? 
Sure, the heap grows from there and the stack grows from the top down. That's the idea. The linker knows the length of each guys. All that information in the .info, in the information file from each of those .o files, tells you how long those things are. So now that, now that, now that I know how long they are, I'll go bloop, 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 put them in there. And, and actually, it doesn't actually put them in there until the end, but it says, okay, that's how long they are. So let me go now fix those, let me fix those links. I can I now know what ordering to them all, and I can now calculate what the absolute address is, and I can now repair and edit those links. So to resolve the references, I search for a data or label in all the user symbol tables. If you're saying I want to load some, you know, load address, well, what address? That's a label. Okay, well, let's look for all the labels in all the symbol tables. <laughs> Can't find it. Symbol, oh no, it'll say linker, symbol not found. If you call a function, if you actually jowl, call some function, that's calling some maybe external function. Maybe you don't have that. Maybe you didn't include that library. Maybe you did decided to, maybe you forgot to include the math library. You're calling sign, but you didn't include the math library. It says no math.o at all. It doesn't even know what math.o or math.a is. It doesn't know what that is at all. So it looks for sign in all the symbol tables. Can't find it. It'll say symbol unknown. That's great. This is also the time when if you had conflicting names, foo has a function baz. Bar has a function baz. Independently, compiler assembler didn't know that. They were just doing their job independently. Just doing my job, sir. Down here. Now I've got two bazes. It's two symbol tables. Now, as I'm compiling all the total symbols that are available, wait, I can't have two bads. It'll say conflicting symbol type. Again, that's an error that only the linker knows about. Only when you see all of them together does the linker know about that. Once you're all done, once you have all the absolutes determined, you can now write in the final machine code. And you're all done. Machine code is all, is all done. So the output of this is an eight out out. Ta-da! Now, what I've described so far is a statically linked executable. It means you load it on all the data and text, and you put it in there, and it's all in a big ball. So if I decided to include the OpenGL library, which is a really big library, a lot of code, a lot of data, well, okay, I'm putting that in there. And then put this, so my a.out starts to grow and grow and grow because it's statically linked. It's all linked together in the file. That's great. Love that. Now all those libraries are part of the executables. Um, so if I update the libraries, um, I don't have to fix it. Let's say I have a new library fix. Well, I don't get it. I have to then recompile that to, uh, if I have the source, we have to recompile it to get that library into it. Because if you make a new library change, well, I, I, this is a baked in, I call it baking in, we call that in computer graphics and in, and in systems. I bake it into the thing, it's there, it's baked in, I can't change it. Um, so if I have a new library, I, I can't get that library. Oh, this new library is really 10 times faster. Sorry, all my executables were compiled with uh, the old library. I have to now recompile them. That's always a pain, right? So if there's, Let's say all the source code for every Apple Mac OS program is referencing one critical library, and then it has a fix. Oh my God, every single person, every single developer has to recompile them and read, and up. look, app update, app update, app update, as everybody has to resend that. That's the static model, because you bake those old libraries in, and if there's a change in the library, I gotta recompile it and read down and share. Oh, there's an update, version point, point oh oh one because the new library I used wasn't, I, my code didn't work, but the library updated, and I need to get make, make sure my users see that update, because it's more efficient, fixes a security hole, whatever. Well, I have to now resend all those updates to everybody. That's annoying. That's the statically linked model. But the advantage is it's self-contained. That's great. The disadvantage is, I mean, the other model, the other model is, a dynamically linked model. And the dynamically linked says, you know what, let's, how about we, no, what, what if not? What if we don't statically link that, that library into the executable? What if we just have a, <laughs> shrinks down to a one liner saying, like pound, kind of a pound include, include this library at runtime. So at runtime, it will dynamically link in the library and then work it out so that the, the loader will then make it run and do the right thing. So it puts the, puts the onus on the loader to fix it all at runtime, which is interesting. This is called a DLL, often in Windows system, for dynamically linked library. Again, what are the advantages of a dynam dynamically linked library? Well, my program, if I have 20, let's say I have 20 different, um, 20 different demos from OpenGL. OpenGL is a graphics library, so you know, here's this squares moving around, and here's circles moving around, here's this maze, blah, 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 here's a 3D something, or ray tracing, okay? All these things are showing and highlighting the OpenGL library, all 20 demos. Well, as OpenGL is changing, OpenGL now has a new version, it's much faster. Instantly, if I download that new version of the library, all 20 get a benefit versus having to now re-download the demos for all 20 and re or recompile them myself, we can do that as well, I could bloop, update one library, now the pointer to them. So that's actually quite interesting. Rather than in a way having copies that are baked in, I reference it there. So that's kind of nice. 
Sending a program requires less time. If I take all the libraries I used to bloat my executables smaller, now all of a sudden getting downloading a program is faster. Maybe I'm paying for data on my cell phone service. Well, that's great. It's a faster download. Love that. Also, executing two programs requires less memory. In a way, if they share a library, you can be clever about how you actually load them in so that you don't you can be referencing the library and have the library running here and all of them are referencing the library, which also kind of is running as well. So that could be really interesting depending on, depending on how it's done at runtime. Now, the downside is at runtime, there's less overhead. Um, th there's, sorry, there's time overhead to do that link. So now when I'm running, rather than go, boop, I got all the stuff here, just go. Now I have to, okay, go grab, oh, pound include. Where is that? Okay, what's over here? Oh, there's an error. I could have an error at runtime. That's an issue. But it also means at runtime, I have to do the, do the work of fixing those links and doing that at runtime. So the startup cost is a little bit higher at runtime. Again, but there's some benefits you saw that. If I have an upgrade, I mentioned this before, if I have an upgrade, I can just upgrade the, the, the lib. XYZ, XYZ could be OpenGL, math, anything you want. libmath.a is our math library, certainly. You could say lib, whatever that is, upgrade that, and then just plug that in, and now all of a sudden, yeah, everybody gets the benefit of that. That's great. But it also means that the executable isn't enough anymore. It means if I somehow corrupt the math library or corrupt the OpenGL library, and I'm, my, program, my 20 programs are using that, none of them will run. They ran yesterday, they don't run today. That's a little scary that, I didn't touch it. I didn't touch this executable. My machine doesn't touch it. Not, you know, memory works, bus system works, everything works, but it doesn't work anymore. Why? Because somehow my, my kid corrupted my OpenGL library and now none of my demos work. And now I'm on stage on TV and none of my, none of my demos work. That's a problem. You can't really trust your executables anymore to work in advance. You don't touch them because your libraries could be touched. Or I downloaded the upgrade and the upgrade kind of quit halfway through. I didn't know that. It looks like I got it, but I actually got half a file. So now it's corrupted. None of those work. So again, you have some trade off there from Runtime, you know it's stable. I download it, it's big and bloated, but I know it's gonna work versus it's smaller, tighter, downloading is faster. I get the free upgrades. If I upgrade that, it'll work and I don't have to kind of recompile, but I go to run it and it may now fail runtime. So again, there's that. And at the bottom, the bottom line says overall dynamic linking adds quite a bit of work complexity to the compiler, linker, and certainly the OS, which is the loader, but some people find that the benefits outweigh those costs. So that's pretty cool. So in summary, the prevailing approach to dynamic linking is to link at the lowest level. You don't link at the upper level. At, let's, let's link at the assembler level. No, we link at the machine code level. I link at the actual executable that's going to run. I make some room for it, grab the library, stuff it in there, and run it like that. So that's, what, again, what the loader has to do, and it's a lot harder to do that. But that's the idea. You have this lowest level. It's called linking at machine code level. This isn't the only, only way to do it, but it's the pre prevailing model of how they do linking, dynamically linked uh, code. Now we're up to the loader. We'll see you at the next lecture.